Is that okay? It's perfect. Thank you. So, Patrick, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I should say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, because some of us are in the US, in Mexico, and myself in Southeast Asia. So we are all over the world and, and with very different time zone. Uh, and this is our inaugural session for the 2023, 2024 Make It Talks. And I'm so happy that we can open and open this cycle with uh, the unpacking open science, open with open, uh, unpacking open science, access rights and equity. Uh, just, uh, you did not come to listen to me, so I will be short, very short. And, uh, and just uh, uh, some, words of introduction. What is an institute for advanced studies? It's a, it's, the, it's a family, the Institute for Advanced Studies, and very essentially, uh, they, are, they were designed and conceived to host visiting scientists coming from all over the world. And this is the main definition, is a, a, a policy to stimulate the mobility. But uh, um, there is another definition, which is uh, offering a breathing space for scientists to to to, to look one step uh, uh, at, at what they are doing, at the world, at their connections. And, and we were lucky enough that the University of Montpellier decided to create an institute for advanced knowledge and not only studies, so different types of knowledge in 2019, which is called Make It, and uh, which is focusing on the interconnection between agriculture, food, environment, and health, which is the main uh, focus of the of the of the university, but more specifically to look at controversies that bring together those sectors or that come across these sectors. Uh, so this is what Make It is, uh, is uh, about. And right from the beginning, what we wanted is, as we say, not functioning as a bubble, not functioning just hosting scientists, but making sure that the, the, their presence could be a driver and a connecting uh, element between the local scientific communities and the worldwide uh, communities and uh, and in, in in the two directions taking advantage of the presence of scientists in Montpellier and in the same time opening our doors and walls to both the the scientists uh, uh, all over the world and to bring together the 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 public society and the civil society in those discussions, which is very much aligned with the topic of today uh, about uh, open science. So uh, for the, the, the ones who join us for the first time, uh, these Make It Talks, these sessions are somehow uh, aligned with what I just said, the platform for dialogue, for continuous dialogue on topics which are at the heart of our our, our um, focus area, and particularly with, which bring together uh, science policy and, and society. And uh, well, we, we are quite pride, proud to bring together a wide range of perspectives from international authorities to local experts in, in Montpellier and to uh, have and stimulate uh, exciting discussion uh, with their very diverse insights and perspective. Uh, well, we, we began recently with these talks and uh, follow, following the, the positive uh, reception of, of last year's series, we were eager to keep the momentum and uh, to go with uh, with these B monthly talks, and today, as I said, we focus on open science. In, in and and this is uh, one very interesting 
and particular topics, which is quite stimulating uh, at the moment where uh, mistrust in science and uh, is dramatically increasing, but uh, I'm quite sure that our Sarah and our speakers will speak about that much better than I, what I can what I can do now. So we have the privilege to hosting four great experts in 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 this field of uh, open science and relationship between. Uh, uh, policy, science, and, and society, and we will uh, not only listen to them, but stimulate this uh, dialogue. And Tharag Herrera, our scientific officer, will introduce uh, all of uh, our guests for the today critical subject. I just would like to um, extend my gratitude to, to you, to our guest speakers for accepting this uh, invitation and participating in this uh, open and, and exciting dialogue. And uh, it's not only valued for us, but also very vital to the success and uh, enrichment of our, of our discussion. So thank you very much, Anna Maria. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, thanks, Tora and uh, Gilles and Brenda for organizing our our talk today. Well, to to glide to to close now. I'm glad to, that all of you could uh, could join, and I'm I'm looking forward to this uh, very exciting perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick, and. Uh... You know, I will repeat uh, the, the something I said before, but here we at Make It, we like uh, the plurality of narratives, the plurality of visions. So sometimes it's very difficult to, to prepare an introduction without framing the discussion in uh, any way. So let's see how it goes today. And uh, I don't know why I cannot change the, the interpretant. I have my video. Yes. So je vais me épingler moi-même. Yes, that's it. Sorry. So today we are here to discuss about open science and movement, which is an idea that is reshaping uh, our understanding and practice of scientific resource in this uh, information rich age. And um, the movement toward open access and open science represent an aspiration, and an aspiration to transform the way knowledge is created, how it is shared and used, looking to fostering a more inclusive and collaborative knowledge community. A shared vision of open science we share here at Make it is one where the scientific process is not uh, limited to the accessibility of data. Ideally, it encompasses a broader spectrum, open access to publication and methodologies, the use of open source software, the adoption of open peer review, and the active engagement of diverse public and stakeholder groups. The ultimate goal of open access and open science is to build a transparent and accessible resource environment that foster collaboration and the reliability and the reproducibility of scientific results. However, the path toward this ideal, and we are all aware of that, this path is fraught with considerable challenges and complexities. Open science, as it stands today, is a landscape of varied interpretation and practices. This diversity, what is, is welcome and is rich, also gives uh, rise to problems such as the emergence of predatory journals. We threaten to threaten the integrity and the equitable access to scientific knowledge and to knowledge in general. So these challenges highlight the disparity between the 
idea, the aspiration of open science and open access, and its practical implementation. So to help us to navigate this complex landscape today, we are joined by four experts. Each of them is a pioneer in the field of open science, and we are honored to welcome to welcome them all, and I would like to introduce them very briefly. We have the pleasure to open our seminar today with a keynote by Ana Maria Sheto. Ana Maria is the president of the UNESCO Open Science Global Steering Committee and a professor at the Instituto de Física de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. This is for the diversity of languages. And uh, UNESCO, as you may be aware, has recognized the need for a global understanding of open science, given the fragmentation of the scientific and political environment. So in her keynote address, Ana Maria will challenge us with key discussions and ideas, offering and stimulating exploration of open science in the context of this diverse and evolving landscape. Our dear colleague and last year Make It Fellow, Eric Walsh, will also be joining us on Zoom. He's already there. Eric is a professor in the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University, where is he also is the director of the Center for Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy Studies, CSTEP. His work falls into a broad concept of open access and open science. He's a researcher and his research covers topics such as genetic resources policies, organization adaptation to climate change, the use of digital technology in government and diversity in science. And very importantly, the focus of uh, Eric go beyond the sample accessibility of data, touching on various aspects of the scientific process, policy making, and the integration of technology into research. Anne Laurent, this, uh, Vice President for Open Science and Research Data at the University of Montpellier is joining us in the amphitheater. She's our local, very local expert today. I am bringing a wealth of experience in the practical implementation of open science, reflecting her central role in the University of Montpellier Open Science Plan. And in addition to her institutional contributions, Anne is also a professor and a researcher, and her work focuses primarily on responsible data management and improving accessibility to research data and publications. The focus or her focus is enriched by her extensive background in computer science uh, with a specialization in data mining and artificial intelligence, which has been instrumental in advancing the field of open science. Finally, we are honored to welcome a special guest from Paris, Andrea Giraldo Sevilla, who is a key member of the Learning Planning Institute, LPI. She belongs to the science, citizen science team. Uh, Andrea there is the research leader for a very interesting project called Pattern Open Research uh, within the citizen science team. And I love this part. Andrea is a champion in integrating science, technology, engineering, our humanities, and mathematics, epistemologically and pedagogical approaches. And she works and like to emphasize always the integration of diverse and not hegemonic epistemologies and learning systems. She has been working all around the world. She has been working at UNESCO, with the UN, with the French Development Agency, and also with local offices of the UN in Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So welcome today to Montpellier. And I will start here, stop here as they will complement their intervention uh, during the, the, their expertise during their contribution. So without further delay, I would like to invite Anna Maria to share her screen and delight us with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adora, for this uh, wonderful introduction. I think you really set the framework. Uh, I would also like to thank Patrick for what he has uh, described to us uh, about Maggie and um, 
it it really well it 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 sounds very attractive when <laughs> would like to go and work there yeah. <laughs> and uh, i'm very happy to be here in the company of of eric and and andrea i think it's a wonderful team and uh, it would be very interesting to to listen to you uh, but well, first it's it's my turn. I'm sorry that we cannot see the the audience. We oh. have no well. no direct contact with the audience. We don't know who is listening to us. Now, <laughs> can you see them now? I can see four empty chairs. <laughs> 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 Just start. <laughs> Good. Well, they start to becoming um, occupied. <laughs> well, uh, I think I, uh, we shouldn't um, take more of our time, and uh, then I will try to share to share my screen. Let's see if it works. Yes. Okay. It's fine. Yes. Fine. Ah, okay. Thank you. So, thank you very much uh, for to to make it uh, for this invitation. And uh, well, you see the title I've I've uh, uh, selected for for this talk, and um, because I see that transition is is an important concept for your institute. Uh, so yes, what we are looking at is. Um, how to transit to open science, um, ideally um, to, to have an open knowledge community, as, as I just said. Uh, so uh, are we on the same page? All, I think if the answer were yes, we would not be here. And the reason that we, I put this question is precisely because we have still to go a long way for this. So, um, in in your <clears throat> in your mission, you say you uh, something about accelerating transitions to achieve the sustainable development goals. And in this regard, well, the the frequency of the key work ecosystem uh, nowadays, for instance, in the titles or in the abstracts of the top strategy journals, has increased sevenfold over the last five years. Everybody speaks now of an open science ecosystem. Well, um, the, the work ecosystem is uh, more and more frequently used also in, in other contexts, but I am here referring to the open science so-called ecosystem. So I took the word transitions from the name of the mission of the Institute and undertook the exercise of critically approaching this subject of the transition to the open science from an ecosystem perspective. And this is uh, more or less the structure of, of my talk. Um, why, why an open science ecosystem? Well, um, to the features that characterize uh, natural ecosystems, you know, which are here, uh, because that's how the, the, the term ecosystem started to appear in the literature because of the natural ecosystems. So there was a basic definition, a community or group or group of living organisms that interact in a specific environment. And ideally they are balanced systems, no? And they can evolve slowly, but can also transform very quickly. It depends on the internal dynamics and on the external environment. In extreme cases, they can even disappear. And one important feature of natural ecosystems is they have no finality or purpose of their own. No? But then there are also artificial ecosystems. Uh, artificial ecosystems are those ecosystems that are human-made, no? um, where biotic and abiotic components are made to interact for survival. And they have a purpose, no? They are made for a purpose, for a human purpose. And uh, normally they are not self-sustaining. They can perish without human help in, in uh, opposition to the natural ecosystems. They have very limited genetic diversity, 
it's important because the natural ecosystems do have a diversity. That's one of the strengths of them. And they have a low chance of evolution. Um, the nutrient cycles are always incomplete. And we, we have um, examples of those, like, for instance, a, a zoo no? or um, an aquarium, etc. And the need for integrated concepts capable of satisfying natural and social scientists and supporting integrated research motivates a conceptual framework for understanding the roles in, in you, of humans in ecosystems, both in artificial ecosystems, but also in those that we have learned to create ourselves, which are the human ecosystems. And uh, the so-called uh, open science ecosystem is, is, is a good example of them. Uh, there is still very little analysis of human ecosystems, but um, there is some already some a bit of literature. We have learned to create artificial ecosystems, no? But then the human ecosystems are, are have we really learned everything that should be learned about them? I think not. Uh, these are ecosystems that I created from scratch. Um, and the authors of several studies propose uh, some models no, based on distributed organizational and uh, information technology platforms, etc. There is, as I said, very little literature. But once there are a few things that already are clear. People can bring into being new things that have not existed before. And that's because of the creativity of human beings. No? That's something that uh, characterizes human beings. I, but if we continue to consider most of the people on earth as burdens or as customers, we will fail. That's another conclusion that has already been drawn from the little experience with human analysis of human ecosystems. Also at the center, in platforms as currently designed, there is limited intelligence and sensitivity to the realities of people. They are technologically driven. They are not really driven by the context, by the, by the, by the people themselves. Um, technology can connect people and augment their validities, their abilities, but value creation is accomplished through billions of daily creative acts. So human ecosystems have a reason to be um, considered on, on their own. Um, they, are, they are important and uh, they will and then more and more human ecosystems will appear on the planet of different kinds. So um, these the ecosystems, normally they organize around a focus, a value, a value proposition or, or, as of, or, or a platform. But the behavior in an ecosystem and ultimately its success is affected by the rules of engagement and the nature of standards and of interfaces. For instance, open versus closed, or imposed versus emergent, etc. Well, the member, uh, this is still on the theory of of um, of, of, of ecosystems. Um, the the approach is an inclusive way to become engaged, to think systemically, to imagine better futures, and co-create them. And an important a feature of the ecosystem is the modularity, which enables it to follow, to allow distinct yet interdependent organizations to coordinate without full hierarchical fiat. The, the hierarchy is not a, is not a must for the for an ecosystems, on the contrary, but um, there must be interactions and those interactions uh, uh, rely on the coexistence of different types of complementarities. That is, every component of an ecosystem must have its own idea of what is its role in the system. And is it complementary to the roles of the others or is it competing with the roles of the others? Ideally, the roles are complementary. The distinct parts of the ecosystem represent organizations that are separated only by thin crossing points there shouldn't be so much overlap, but there should certainly be some contact uh, in, the, in the way of crossing points. So the behavior in ecosystem and ultimately success, as I said, is affected by the rules of, of engagement. 
Now, um, the member organizations also include suppliers, lead producers, competitors, and other stakeholders. And over time, they they co-evolve. Mm. They 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 co-evolve. Um, and that leads to an evolution of the system as a whole. They co-evolve their capabilities and their roles and tend to align themselves with the directions set by one or more central organizations. But those companies holding leadership roles may change over time. It doesn't mean that there must be a, a standard and, and, st and static um, leadership or central uh, institution because um, the interactions may evolve in such a way that also the leadership can change. So quite different, even concept, conflicting concepts, models, types of, of open access are operating today. Are we, do we have an ecosystem? It doesn't seem so. For example, in my region in Latin America and Caribbean, open access means free and open access for everybody, from author to end user, with no paywalls with no APCs. Also, open access tends differ substantially, as we will see in, in the next uh, slides. So this uh, seems to uh, imply that um, if we go from open access to open science, we have to first look at whether we are really working as an organic system, as an ecosystem in the open access environment, and what are the main challenges that have not been addressed today so that we don't inherit them in the transit to open science. In the open access environment, we have, as I said, conflicting models. We have already di the diamond model as a, as a central diamond open access model as a central component, but not yet uh, universally accepted. We are far from that. We have in contrast to that, the gold open access, and we have green open access, and then many others, no? Quite different conflict, conflicting uh, concepts. Um, why do I say that the, the, the landscape, landscape is fragmented? Because it is difficult to bring all this together in one ecosystem uh, concept. Um, because Why? Because there are conflicting trends also. Simply look look at this uh, map. Um, initially, the Open APC register uh, in 2005 had a few uh, components. We had uh, Springer Science with uh, some revenues, uh, another Future Medicine with some revenues, and Optical Society or Optical Society of America with some. And what happened along these years? Well. Uh, from 2005 to 2023, uh, the landscape has transited from this uh, originally th three components to this very, very uh, rich component, rich uh, landscape. Um, initial open access, uh, open IP IPC register uh, is, is already part of the history. I remember Martin Blume, the uh, editor-in-chief of American Physical Society, explaining to me already in the 1990s that uh, journal APCs in those times was their main source of income, which was used to support other APS activities. And yet, and yes, it has become a source of income, and not just for the for the scientific societies but also for the for the publishers, for the editors and publishers. And uh, this has been, uh, moreover, um, boosted by the uh, Plan S, no? the APC business model, with some publishers charging over 5,000 US dollars per article. So it has become a big business. And it has led to an exponential increase in transformative agreements between universities and corporate publishers around the world, covering an accumulated figure of 900,000 papers today in 2023, as you can see from this graph, which adds to their already huge business. Note that all this capital flow from around the world is concentrated in or transferred to the United States and a few countries in Europe. We must bear in mind that in the last half century, 
Tens of thousands of journals have appeared all around the world, and every year more than two and a half million articles are published. This is the size of the business. There are hundreds of journals in each discipline, and there is so much new information that it is almost or completely impossible to keep up to date. So, but the potential for business is huge. We don't read all that we publish. We don't read all that we have to buy in order to read or that we have to pay for in order to be published. This is the situation today. <clears throat> no wonder there is a proliferation of publishers, well-meaning or malicious, who take advantage of this window of opportunity to make a profit, as was mentioned uh, just before in the introduction. No? but not with the same intensity everywhere. And that's interesting. That's where you can see another facet of this uh, fragmented landscape. As you can see um, in the next, um, in this slide, um, <clears throat> from, from this pie chart, the so-called predatory publishers are not equally distributed. You might ask, why is the Latin American figure so low? It is only, well, it's called South America because that's how uh, other uh, analysts uh, classify us, but in, in actually it's Latin America and the Caribbean, and it accounts only for 0.5% of the total of predatory publishers in um, uh, figures of some years ago. Uh, unfortunately, the figures have grown everywhere in Latin America, but also in the rest of the world. And predatory publishing has become also a, a big business. No? But why is it so low in South America? And here we come to another aspect of the fragmented landscape. Open access has always existed in Latin America because the journals have mostly been maintained by universities and learned societies, and therefore publicly funded. You can see it on the slide. And we see these, um, <clears throat> these um, platforms as part of the of the mission that we have to uh, make the, the uh, science and the scientific knowledge and the publications uh, open to everybody and without any charge. The APC represent an additional cost for, for us because they have funded the research, all our university, and now we also have to fund the publication of the results in addition for, to continuing to pay subscription fees and to maintain our own journals. For example, in 2022, one year ago, my university, UNAM, spent over 20 and a half million euros on commercial databases and journal subscriptions, plus an unspecified amount of on APCs. So in addition to promoting the quality and the visibility of the journals and providing free and open access to them, this well-established ecosystem, because in Latin America we can speak of one, in which the members play their specific complementary roles, promotes shared values and benefits from the community of the members. Here in this slide we can see speaking of commonalities. An important one is the widespread use of Spanish and Portuguese, which we share with Spain and Portugal. At the same time, we are inclusive and take into account the diversity of other languages. As you can see from the Latindex menu on the right, no? we have even Maya, Nahuatl, and other languages because we are inclusive. We are mindful of the link between linguistic and cultural diversity and biodiversity, which has been clearly demonstrated in the case of Mexico, for example. This, is a, this slide is a, uh, the result of, of a study made by the Comisión Nacional de Biodiversidad, where they establish a, a close relationship, a correlation between the cultural diversity and the linguistic diversity and the biodiversity in the, the various parts of Mexico, of the, of the territory of, of Mexico. Free and open access is not just a principle for us, it is a reality and it works. You can see here um, net, uh, from uh, Redalic this image where uh, the publications of uh, produced in Latin America and the Caribbean are read and are consulted everywhere around the world. And they are free and open, no cost for anybody. 
Nevertheless, and contrary to our tradition, some publishers, predatory or not, are following the mainstream co commercial business model and starting to charge APCs, taking advantage of the pressure to publish placed on authors by the performance assessment systems. And so, given this fragmented landscape, what are the prospects for a transition from open access to open science? What are the guiding principles, the rules of engagement that can guarantee a healthy open science ecosystem? Is the open science community ready and willing to shift gears? Here we say the data uh, appears to be moving away from centralization. It is becoming more diverse and less integrated. That's thereby exacerbating the discovery and usability problem for both human and computational stakeholders. All research objects should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, both for machines and for people. This is the uh, statement made by, by FAIR, which we don't uh, completely agree with, because we think that the, the, um, the data, that the, the reusability problem is not exacerbated by the, uh, by the fact that uh, um, we are moving away from centralization. On the contrary, moving away from centralization, if, if properly uh, carried out, can uh, mean a, a, um, a more extended democratization. So uh, what we think is uh, we have to move to this more democratizing uh, concept of open access and of open science which means also a, a radical change in the concept of science itself. And this is where the UNESCO recommendation uh, very, is, is a very timely um, uh, uh, and very helpful tool to guide us in this uh, necessary change, in this necessary transition from the closed concept of science that has prevailed so far to a more open concept, which means not only um, it, uh, an introduction of new tools, a development of, of new uh, tools, but also uh, conceptually a change and, and in, in actual practice, a change of culture of the scientists, of the scientific environment and of the institutions that assess the scientific um, uh, um, performance. In this regard, the knowledge community, which was mentioned in the introduction, I think ideally it should become the, com the community of everybody. That is, human beings are in essence also knowledge holders. And science has, um, um, has excluded much of the knowledge community by being um, by adopting a rather elitist view of, of science. But we have we are in very interesting times where we can change as long as we uh, still continue to uphold um, some uh, important principles that can bring us together and that can guide, guide us in 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 this um, in this transition and there are the the unesco principles of quality and integrity of collective benefit of equity and fairness of diversity and and inclusiveness I won't go into the pillars and the benefits of open science because I am sure that you, you know them as well as I do. What is important is that indeed, if we want, eco, uh, we want open science to become, an, uh, the open science ecosystem to become a real ecosystem that has a long life, uh, we have to consider that each component of this widened ecosystem has a role to play in the in its operationalization as well as benefits to gain. We all can benefit from this opening of, of science. UNESCO itself, with the support of the uh, five ad hoc working groups, is playing, is helping its member states to implement the recommendation to the five main challenges identified by the working groups, which are here changing the conventional scientific culture, which I've mentioned building the necessary human and institutional capacities, having adequate open science infrastructures in place, 
inclusion of posted connectivity, reviewing the criteria for assessing scientific quality and addressing the negative or unintended, unintended consequences of open science. I have added a, a sixth one, which I think is important in view of what I have uh, mentioned and discussed along this talk, which is moving away from for-profit business models that exacerbate inequities and run counter to UNESCO's open science principles and values. And before ending, I would like to um, go back to um, um, something that was mentioned also in the introduction to this, this session, which is the mistrust in science. Uh, yes, mistrust in science uh, is an issue today. Uh, there are um, very recent examples of, of this mistrust, for instance, uh, uh, the resistance to vaccines and during the COVID pandemic and others. But I think I'm convinced that the, the real way to deal with this mistrust in science is precisely to change this concept of science, to open it up and to establish a, 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 a truthful dialogue with other knowledge holders, with other communities, and make um, scientific knowledge as uh, something that is valuable for everybody and which everybody can access to. It's not just um, open science does not mean simply opening the access to science that has already been produced. It is in opening the concept of science, also opening uh, it up to other knowledge systems and to establishing the bridges with all due respect with other knowledge holders and make uh, therefore science more universal. And to the extent that also the educational system and not just the scientific system can help in this endeavor, I think the mistrust in science uh, will become um, a lesser issue than it is today. So this, uh, I would like to end with this in order to um, give uh, some time for the discussions because uh, uh, I understand we that we are here for a dialogue and not just to listen to, um, to the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ana Maria. And while Eric prepared his uh, screen sharing, I just want, would like to, to highlight this idea of the dynamic ecosystem. And I really love this, uh, this comparison. And in this dynamic, uh, when you know, you know something about ecology, you have all these interaction, competition you already mentioned, parasitism. We can see some examples in your talk. But there is also mutualism and many beneficial uh, interaction between the different components of the ecosystem. I think one of the key points today is to engage people in, in this conversation, how we can boost the beneficial interaction in this ecosystem, acknowledging that this is dynamic and that there will be always some uh, pressure to, to move to the other directions. But, you know, how we engage as a stakeholders, as researchers, as scientists, to promote this kind of beneficial interactions. So we will talk about this later. You are welcome, Eric, uh, to start. Yes, and I invite, uh, I invite Aunt and Andrea, if they are ready, they go to the front to, to give you a nicer view of your interlocutors today. Great, thank you very much. Um, can, can you see my screen? It's perfect, yes. Okay, okay, great. So, um, so thank you very much for inviting me for this today. I'm very excited to talk about um, uh, what we've been doing. Um, and I would like to sort of start with um, thanking Anna Maria for very thoughtful and insightful uh, comments that stimulate sort of some of my thinking. And also um, it's quite interesting to see how these, some of these issues of ecosystem and, and fragmentation are reflected in my study as well. I want to thank uh, Thora as well, and Patrick, certainly, um, 
for all of their support. Um, I was at Make It last year as a um, um, as a fellow, and I had a great time. I recommend it for anybody. Um, and um, and uh, as very stimulating and um, very interesting uh, interaction with uh, the community there in Montpellier. I actually really miss Montpellier at this point. Anyway, um, my talk today is is sort of designed to go a little bit uh, into uh, the details of a part of open science, which is more on data sourcing, data access, and data sharing. Um, I I uh, I agree that you know um, with Anna Maria that that uh, things are very fragmented. Uh, uh, the 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 data ecosystem is is changing um, and it's dynamic. Um, and and yet, you know, for me, I always have to sort of find out how. I want to know how is this happening? Why is it happening? Um, and so this study, which is a, a study of the National Science Foundation study that is just at the end of its data collection, and we have just started presenting uh, some of the findings um, and we presented last week at the American Association of Public Policy and Management. And um, and so I don't have very much time. I have supposedly 10 minutes. I'm going to maybe go over that. But um, but I wanted to give you some, 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 some thoughts on this. This study is about genomic science and genomic research that's happening globally. And it's very data intensive. Governments are really investing in data infrastructure and encouraging more data use, data access, data sharing. The sort of open data systems, open repositories are really being developed rapidly. Um, and, and within this, um, we, had, um, we had a crisis. We had this COVID-19 pandemic um, that really tested the norms and the practices for data sharing to rapidly advance research. Um, and while the early reports were like very interesting and in showing that that um, you know there's record-breaking scientific collaboration um, and uh, public release of DNA sequences. You know, the macro level approaches really don't look at the micro level kinds of things. And so I'm in this talk, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about micro, but also linking macro to micro. So the questions really are, how do resource, researchers source and share their data? How do crises affect data sourcing and sharing? And what role do institutional logics play on data sharing? So this study is pretty interesting, actually, I have to say, because it takes it conducts two global surveys, one in 2020, which is during the peak of the COVID-19, and one in 2021, which is after the peak, right after the vaccines were distributed. Uh, and we it was it is a global survey, 86 countries in 2020 and 104 countries in 20, uh, 2021. We surveyed people who, uh, we so the unit of analysis is the research paper. So we identified all the COVID research papers within the first five months of the crisis, and we surveyed the, the corresponding authors of those papers to find out use uh, and sharing activities. We did the same thing. Then we developed a sort of a, a, um, a matched sample of, of scientists who do genomics work in the same areas, uh, but not on COVID. And we did the same thing in 2021. So we have a two by two cross uh, comparison approach with COVID, non-COVID, 2020. 20 and 2021, that is global. So the first thing I want to talk about is really the complexities of the access and data sharing. And I could sort of say that complexity is just another word for fragmentation. But when we ask people where they got their data, 
Um, this is uh, basically a composite of where they, uh, the different places they got data. So they got data from public repositories, from university repositories, other researchers, some data they already had, they data collected for the project and other sources. And, and notice that the percentages are pretty high. So in other words, people were getting data from multiple sources. Another point here is that we often think about data sharing as sharing from one person to the other person in sort of a dyadic approach, but there's very little of that that goes on. So it's mostly to repositories and, and from repositories. How do they share their data though, right? And so we asked a series of questions and we did not link them in the survey. So we asked them outright about the sharing of the data that they have re for the paper that they published. And 37% said they don't share the data um, and 58% basically said they did share the data and a few percent said um, they didn't know. And um, and then, but if you take a look at the no, didn't share part, there's a bunch of people who said they didn't share, but then said they posted the data with a preprint. And there's a bunch of people in the didn't share part that, um, that said that the data were already available in a repository. So you end up with about 15.5% who are adamant or very sort of specific about not sharing their data, whereas sort of the data sharing environment is very, very complicated. Some of it is with preprints, some of it's overlapping. I mean, if you think about the, the, the overlapping uh, diagram of of journal articles that Anna Marie pre presented, you could do some similar thing with how data are shared. Um, yeah, it's very fragmented. What about the role of the crisis on the data sources and on data sharing? Well, when we compare COVID and non-COVID researchers in just the 2020 survey, COVID-19 researchers are more likely to use RNA sequences uh, released by others in open repositories. Non-COVID-19 researchers are more likely to collect their own data. Data sharing, COVID-19 researchers are more likely to share data and share it in multiple ways. And it's particularly true in North America for North American and European researchers, which just sort of indicates that that's where a lot of the, the that that work was was done and gets to some of these equity issues, structural equity issues. Preprints, so archive postings, that was also on Anna Maria's pre, uh, um, diagram. COVID nineteen researchers are more likely to post preprints and archives. So you do have differences between COVID-19 and, and non-COVID-19 researchers in genomic research. Then if we look across surveys 2020 and 2021, and really we're really at the beginning of, of the analysis. So I can only offer a couple of things. Two years after the first outbreak of the pandemic, COVID-19 researchers are less likely to get data from public repositories than during the early stage of the crisis. And this just sort of highlights the central role that data repositories have for ensuring broad access to data during an emergency. But as a society, as the society moved further away from the peak of the crisis, researchers are less likely to share their data through archives and instead prefer uh, traditional data sharing options um, such as data repositories. So archives also were uh, flooded with research and po data postings and sort of very intense engagement of, of researchers. What's interesting also is that during the COVID crisis, people, uh, researchers gave less feedback to data sources than during uh, than than afterwards. So um, that could indicate that they don't have time to give feedback on the data. 
It could also indicate that 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 what happened was a very a much more intensive and informal engagement across researchers in which they were communicating in different ways and not formally to to uh, the data sources. Okay, so we have a fragmented world and there's a lot going on. We see transitions. Um, the crisis mattered. Um, so how do we think about this in in sort of a broader sense and and in ways that can help us explain what researcher behavior is, uh, what drives it? Um, so we want to link uh, institutions and individuals, and we take a, an ecosystem approach to open science. And, and to be honest, it's a little bit different uh, than the ecosystem uh, perspective of Anna Marie, but, but this is really a macro meso micro approach in which the macro is, is about the institutions, the culture, the norms, um, and the micro is really about the researcher behavior. And the meso is in, in between those networks and organizations that sort of govern and in, enable uh, open science. So this, this last little part of my of my presentation is really trying to link macro to micro and I take an institutional logics approach and the institutional logics approach is this idea that institutional logics are the frameworks that orient actors to interpret reality. And so they are the frames of reference that individuals have they provide meaning and justification for their actions. They create, they enable, they provide legitimacy to researchers. Um, and, and the thing is that there isn't one logic, there's multiple logics. And the multiple logics are embedded in a social context and individuals experience tensions and conflicts between those different logics. And they choose to prioritize logics, some over others. In and researchers are embedded in a very high institutional complexity environment where they have different regulatory regimes, different disciplinary norms, different field cultures, uh, different research teams, and and uh, you know diversity of research teams, etc. So we want to know to what extent data sharing practices reproduce macro level institutional logics. To what extent do data sharing practices align with dominant science logics and emerging logics? How does the social context of COVID-19 affect data sharing practices and how is it linked to institutional logics? So what do I mean by institutional logics? There's an academic logic that we're all familiar with. It emphasizes a search for production and fundamental knowledge, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a commercial logic, which Anna Marie mentioned in the sort of the APC uh, perspective. It values applied research, entrepreneurship, innovation, economic return. As a society impact, that's increasingly important. And it's a challenge-led science, right? And 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 its framing is broader than uh, uh, generating commercial value, its value for society. There's an equity uh, logic, I mean, science as an enterprise should be accountable to address differences in values, knowledges, power, and capacity. And there's a community logic that's emerging in data intensive where mutual interdependence requires pooling of resources and global interdisciplinary collaboration. And there's an openness logic, commitment and adherence to sharing and open publicly accessible repositories, transparency of science production and reusability of knowledge. And I have to say that these are not uh, isolated. Everybody uses these, everybody justifies behavior. So what do we find? In just in the 2020 data, data sharing and open repositories for the COVID-19 group, when they have a higher society logic and a lower commercial logic, they're more likely to share in open repositories. Data sharing in open repositories for the non-COVID group, people who don't do COVID research, 
they're more likely to share in open repositories when they have an academic logic, prioritize an academic logic, um, uh, deprioritize an ad academic logic, but, but prioritize a community logic, the o o omic science logic. And posting data with a preprint for COVID-19 and for the non-COVID-19 are uh, advanced with a priority of openness logic, publishing in an open format. So our current understanding of the dynamics of data access and sharing for science is incomplete. And we, we really uh, need to be paying a better attention to the social elements, the dynamic nature of data systems, the influential institutions and critical events. So what does this mean for us? Uh, it means that uh, maybe we should look at stronger policy imperatives, or maybe we should look at opportunities for, for greater focus at the meso level, for greater network governance and sharing practices. Or maybe we need to focus at the researcher level uh, and, and better capacitate them to leverage the dynamic data environment. Anyway, that's my presentation today, and um, I'm really pleased to be able to 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 uh, to give, you know give you a barrage of findings. But I think that they generally complement uh, what Anna Marie was talking about. Thank you, Aaron, for this presentation. Um, we are going now to listen more about the situation here in Australia. Uh, so, if Andy will uh, listen um, about the presentation about the milestones that were uh, being set up uh, here, the data institute uh, that has been in the last few years. <laughs> So, of course, when dealing with open science uh, in uh, computer science, so when dealing with open science, I'm biased because I'm working with data. I'm working, in fact, I'm working in the course, at the crossroad between databases and artificial intelligence. My job is to figure out how to store data for leveraging their use. So, of course, we don't store data the same way depending on the use. And what's, what has changed this last year is that at the beginning of databases, when collecting data, it was quite always targeted. I mean, you have a need, you implement the software, and you deal with some data for, uh, you know, uh, for instance, adding some information on this and this and this that you need. For your final, uh, for instance, uh, uh, thing you want to do. At some point, and because, um, for instance, because of thanks to uh, the Internet of Things and sensors, at some point this has changed and it has become the opposite, meaning that it was not because you had uh, something to implement that you went back to data, it was. You come with data, and then what to do with uh, with this data? So I'm working on this. The name is data lakes, and we try to store data. And this is in science. This is very true that we have data, and we try to do something with this data. So uh, this is uh, some point. And what is important is that uh, starting from this, we have to work with how to deal with, how to describe this data, how to say that it uh, deals with this and this and these topics, and how to try to do this uh, with um, a view that is as uh, neutral without any bias as possible. So, all of this, I have said this, 
I need to tell you that open science can also be a research topic, meaning that by doing this, by describing data, by trying to do it possible that several descriptions can be aligned, can be understood, whatever the language you are speaking, whatever the field in science you, are, you come from, should you be a biologist, should you be a practitioner or a physician, then it will be okay for you to access and to understand the description of data. And this is one of the pillars of uh, current research in knowledge bases and databases, how to do this uh, thing. So this is the way we, we do research. Um, as a vice president of the university, we work on three pillars of open science, uh, open publication, open data, and uh, open source, open software. And how we implement this, this is what you said, we are we have set up three years ago the Data Science Institute of Montpellier, Institut de Sciences des Données de Montpellier. And what we do in this institute is we do not any research. We try to help researchers to deal with their data and to exploit them as easily as possible. So this is a kind of pillar of, of open science, open data, let's say, because what we say is that when dealing with open science, it's like a very small part of everything you have to do for doing research. You say, you see. Wow. And by doing this, we try to implement these best practices of dealing with science and dealing with, uh, with data. So it's all about trainings, it's all, all about having some infrastructures, data storage, HPC, uh, high performance computing, and cloud uh, infrastructures for dealing with, uh, with data. So these best practices, if they aim uh, to share data, most of the time, these best practices are, are for yourself. I'm pretty sure that uh, you have experimented this, that you were working on some something, some data or whatever, and six months, two years after this, you you try to, you know, to work again with this data, and then no idea where you put this data. So I'm saying this to tell you that all these best practices, all these um, ideas about open science the very first goal you can have is yourself, how to deal with uh, your data, your publications, your softwares, your training uh, materials, and everything you are, you are working with. So um, regarding open science, I would like to highlight three, three points. Um, first of all, and this is uh, almost what I was just saying, is that Open science, from my point of view, is not a goal, it's a mean. It's a mean for doing good research, you know, as it, as it was uh, best practices. Because when facing current challenges, uh, I think and I claim that we have now to deal with interdisciplinary, uh, multiple fields and to cross uh, everything and for navigating through this uh, knowledge, this, this um, material we have to, 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 to have everything available, everything discoverable and everything usable and uh, the, the first two uh, presentations were all about this. Uh, I see science as a kind of iceberg and open science is a very small part you can see, but everything we have to work on, the science in progress, everything is hidden. If you are not a researcher, you don't know, you are not aware of everything hidden, but we do know that it's not that easy and uh, it's all done by baby steps. It's all done, uh, you know, how, 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 how it can be, and this is a long-term uh, task. So this process is done by scientists. 
This is researchers working on research. And one thing currently done in open science is to see it as sometimes as something very, uh, you know, administrative for for uh, applying for grants, you must you must have this and this and this. This is not all about research and all about science. So we have to turn this the 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 other the other way because science is done in research labs. It's not done when you apply to grants. It's not done when you apply for positions and so on. So this is my 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 second point of. Be care being careful where when speaking about science uh, of uh, keeping uh, and putting science first. So, uh, for instance, we are currently uh, leading a study uh, with the French Ministry of uh, Research and Innovation about who are the people working with data when dealing with open data and where are these people working. And we have asked uh, researchers, engineers, librarians, everybody to answer this. And uh, most of the people they answer, I'm working in a research lab. So this is, uh, I, I mean, this is uh, quite obvious, but it, this was not the first idea we, we had because for us, working on open science is putting together people with very, very different skills and very, very different, um, um, I mean, backgrounds, which is not easy. We are all speaking and very often here in Make It, we are often speaking about uh, interdisciplinary research with researchers for, with many backgrounds. It's not common to speak about having people with different backgrounds, but not only with others. And open science is not, of course, I've said it's a big, big part of research, but it's also having uh, in mind the regulations, having in mind um, uh, what is the price of this, uh, having in mind uh, what is the policy of my institution about this, and etc. etc. And it's not all the people working one after the other one, it's the people working together with interdisciplinary. And as I said, it's not only researchers, it's not only engineers, it's not only lawyers. So this is a big, big point in open science, how to put this together. So how to put this together uh, is we have to change our culture and we have to make it possible. We have to make it easy. We have to make it normative. Uh, how to say that in your communities, in your field, it will be uh, the way it works. We have to do it rewarding, and it was said uh, previously, what about assessment and research assessment? This is a very, very uh, big point. For instance, the University of Montpellier has not signed yet the DORA um, um, uh, document. What is DORA? DORA is um, it's a document um, putting together uh, some um, practices about how to assess research in your institution. For instance, not only counting the number of papers you have, not only counting the quality from this and this and this uh, uh, of your papers, but also having a scientific view of what you did. And uh, it's it's a big, big challenge and a big, big deal uh, with um, when you sign this because it's it means that all the way, for instance, you run uh, people and you run projects and everything uh, becomes more difficult. So this is the point. So possible, easy, normative, rewarding, and required. And this is this was also a question. 
raised previously. Should it come from the policy or should it come from the result? Uh, from my point of view, it, it's like hybrid. We have to make it easy and possible to do open science, and we have to make it rewarding and uh, required so that everybody together we we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. We are now about to hear about another chapter of the global handbook of uh, on uh, um, open science. Uh, so we have Andrea from the Learning Planet Institute. Can you tell me about uh, more about the, the page that you are writing at the moment on this uh, on this global book? Well, I will talk about it later, but uh, we're basically working on a model uh, in which we are including um, the motivational factors as the basis of uh, the competency models. I don't know if you've already worked with competency models, uh, but uh, I mean, most of the competency models uh, differentiate between know what and know how. So basically knowledge, uh, which is the theoretical part of it, and how this knowledge is applied, uh, which is the know-how uh, and the skills, what we call skills, it's not the same thing. Uh, so uh, we are adding a new category, which is the know why, as a way to assess the motivational factors and the, the, the liquid pipeline also in the, in the choice of the different careers by the different uh, social cultural factors, gender factors, and so on. So this is more or less what we're doing now. No, yeah, well, I mean, ah, okay. it's, uh, it's not working. Can you make it full screen or? Yeah, I can change the slide. Ah, okay, because that is, is not. So I can go there and change it to. <laughs> okay. As you wish. Yeah, sure. This is a too big room for us. Sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> <Richard? no> <laughs> but we listen to the presentations, uh, and I'm actually bringing a bit more. Of open science in action, or you know, this link between theory and uh, the practical aspects of it. And uh, basically, uh, there is one word that stayed with me that is the capacity building, and it's more about literacy, about how to bring uh, different stakeholders, citizens, policymakers, uh, and, and actual researchers working together. Uh, and it, it identifying this kind of mistrust in science and this kind of gaps that we have in our different uh, worlds and, and languages. So uh, citizen science uh, is an alternative way to bring data uh, and to be this data with citizens. So we have different le uh, levels of citizen science. Uh, this is, uh, we can see, uh, just there, um, like the different development goals. I don't know if you know that there are different targets and different indicators. So this has been a huge work. I, I added in comments uh, the, the, the sources, so you can click on it. And this is actually a, an overview of the citizen science uh, related data and how this is contributing to the SDGs. So uh, in the first column, we have uh, the target uh, one, target two, and so on. Uh, and we can see that most of the data is related to uh, like the, like the you know, water, between, uh, uh, it's also related to uh, biology, to, to, to natural ecosystems, to infrastructures. And we have some data in, uh, in health, I mean, in health, we have a lot of, of data, it's more or less uh, well related, but we can see where are the gaps in, in grade, you know, so I invite you to take a look at it. But the most important thing is that uh, we uh, need to, like, methodologies for the engagement 
tools to bring the public as a participants in, in, in science as an alternative uh, way and an alternative source and, and, and also an alternative researchers uh, um, to official data, uh, to governmental data that, as we know, uh, it depends a lot, a lot on how we construct this data and which different views we have. And also uh, to change this culture to bring a lot uh, of literacy in our community and, and, and with uh, citizens. Uh, the learning paths are very important. So the two projects that, that I'm going to present are related to education, uh, public policy, and research. So um, I think that I did it in another uh, tool, but Basically, it's this kind of different uh, link between uh, theoretical and practical. So, in this, we discussed about open science as this approach uh, for the scientific process, for open co a cooperative work, uh, tools, and efficient knowledge. Uh, in practice, I haven't had actually uh, the, the previous presentation comment of open science as a research uh, topic, which uh, I will add it. Thank you so much for the contribution. But we consider it as a, a kind of compliance rules, a policy context that actually brings a common framework, a common agenda for action, a common language, and endeavor to accelerate also our actions and communicate with other stakeholders. Then we work with the responsible research and innovation, which is a, a new term a, in, 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 in this landscape. Uh, that is basically engaging the public and different stakeholders uh, to respond to the needs of, of society, which is different than citizen science, that is about engaging citizens. So here we can see the conceptual difference and then uh, the practical differences is that the responsible research and innovation, we basically en enlarge a bit our stakeholders and our beneficiaries. We work with citizens, with policymakers, and uh, with researchers. And there is this question of the societal challenge that is actually one of our, I mean, it's, it's how we have conceived the projects. And uh, citizen science, that is community-driven science for the creation of knowledge and, and, and capabilities. So at the NPI, we have been working with citizen science for a while. It's quite well known here in France, along with uh, uh, the Coins of Project at the UHSS, to mention other institutions in France that are working on this. Uh, and these are four uh, projects that have been uh, under, that have been uh, uh, coordinated in uh, international and European level. Uh, the international level has been across for SDG, and the other three have been at European level. So, uh, I'm going to talk, you have the link to the projects, you have the link to the outcomes. Growth for SDG and Heidi projects have already finalized, and uh, there are interesting reports about the different methodologies that they use to bring the public. And um, Growth for SDG, they have been using a lot the, the um, social networks to bring, to, uh, to bring the public. Heidi project has been this, uh, pandemic situation and post-pandemic situation. They finalized their project last year, and there are a lot of actions that they've done with the higher education institutions uh, to support community-driven actions in universities. And these two new projects that have started recently uh, at our team, which is the European Citizen Science that started last year, and Pattern Open Research uh, that started that started this year, and, and it's the, the project that I'm going to present you. So in pattern, uh, we are uh, developing uh, training modules and piloting these training modules uh, in a different transferable skills that we have separated and uh, identified in a open, a responsible research and knowledge. So the first one has been open access. We have discussed a lot about it today. Uh, the second one is for data management as well, citizen science, uh, research integrity, gender and non-discrimination, dissemination and exploitation of resources, science communication and management and leadership. 
but not from the economic and commercial perspective, but more about social and emotional uh, skills, uh, managing emotions, sweat to situations, and leadership in research. So we are a consortium of uh, 10 partners and 25 different universities, piloting organizations. Uh, our methodology is basically this consolidation of knowledge. So we are, a, I mean, we have done a systematic uh, mapping and we are analyzing currently the, the, the learning resources uh, gaps in order for us to have a basis uh, to build our uh, learning paths, our curriculum, as well as uh, our learning models. And we have carried out uh, for the first semester mutual learning activities. The second part in which uh, we are working at the LPI is uh, developing this training and platform. So that's where we bring these uh, dynamic ecosystems uh, in our model and uh, interdisciplinarity, uh, as well as uh, this is a mixed method approach because we are also uh, apart from network and, 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 and data science, uh, we are also uh, testing this uh, in, the, in the courses, uh, developing this protocol and uh, gathering the data also with, with uh, our, our own students. So in this project, we are developing a competency framework to energy techniques. Uh, which is uh, an instrument, a tool, and the methodology used uh, in medicine to uh, arrive to consensus. Usually, competency frameworks that are done, I don't know if you uh, followed up, but uh, it, it's been done through focus groups uh, in close groups of experts at the European Commission, UNESCO, and so on. And then it's basically something that we bring. Uh, to the ministries of education and to the to the schools, like okay, these are the competencies that you have to put into place. You have to transform your way of teaching, and there is no, uh, first of all, a uh, sensibilization of the teachers and the professors, and uh, they're not taken into account. So these concepts uh, seem to be something that, that they've been doing, but they have, and there is a kind of. Uh, how to say, kind of path that can be taken into account to, for them uh, to actually realize that it is not changing the teaching practice, but it's rather uh, adapting it to the, the, the needs of different stakeholders. We're also developing a curriculum, uh, this learning path suggestions uh, with, uh, with AI, and we are providing a digital ecosystem also and these learning models. So in order for it to be 100% ethical, the sustainability plan, we're starting like since the beginning of the project, uh, because we would like it to be uh, openly accessible and, and for free for the community. This uh, will be tested uh, in two learning cycles. So the project is just three years, but we will continue. And we are currently working on this evidence for policy development, linking uh, institutional policies at the university with national and international policies and the different uh, activities that are uh, put into use. So when we talk about equity and inclusion in, in our learning models, we have this framework for open and uh, reproducible research training for academic will of privilege into account. I really invite you to click on it because you have a lot, a lot of uh, uh, resources. And we basically have these different categories into account while developing uh, our, our learning models. So uh, race, health and well-being, childhood and development, uh, and development living and culture, uh, which is all about uh, language, citizenship, uh, spirituality, and culture. Uh, also, caregiving in uh, education and career uh, categories. Uh, this is also very helpful while you are doing a group activity. You can uh, do the different groups depending, like uh, mixing them and, and calculating a way to, 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 to create these groups. 
And uh, unfortunately, there are not the other uh, slides, but I was, you know, showing a bit more about uh, this uh, framework and this model that we're doing. Uh, but we can discuss about it later. later. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think most presentations uh, cover the uh, the idea that we could uh, foster institutional uh, resources or institutional um, incentives to uh, sustain uh, open science practices. Um, we, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure that in the room there are some questions. Uh, and I'm also sure that uh, Tara has some questions as well for all of the, the, the speakers. Uh, do you want to start uh, the, the, the connection? Do you ask, uh, I don't know, maybe Professor Cheto or other people? Some In fact, questions? To, to everyone, and I take inspiration from Eric, I think that we have seen an array of effort at the micro, meso, and macro level of organizing open science, and I think this is very interesting. And uh, the main question, or the first question that comes to my mind is when you are fostering all these efforts at the different scale. How do you see yourself integrating in the big picture of open science? If there is, you know, this framework, is that the first framework, is the UNESCO framework inspiring you with this activity? Or there is also some innovation going you know, trying to go beyond what is being established as the pathway for open science. And I think so many interesting uh, efforts to, to foster open science with the students, with resources, with society, with citizens, doing research on open science, Eric and, and, and Anna Maria doing a splendid work of coordinated effort at the international level. So my first question is, how can you see these micro, macro, and uh, meso level efforts integrating to make the open science ecosystem to evolve globally to the idea of utopia of this open science. Who wants to start? Eric and Maria, do you want to move to start? Or you, we can pass to another question. Mm -hmm. Well, if you allow me, uh, I think um, Eric is the one who should respond to this, <laughs> to this question. But uh, I would like to say first that I really like very much uh, the dissection that Eric made of these institutional logics you know, that are operating. Um, and a, a, a very quick response to, to the question, as far as I could understand it, because this sound didn't allow me to understand all the words. Um, a quick response would be that, in fact, um, precisely this 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 section of the operational logics may, uh, makes it clear that there is a role for everybody, you no, know, um, in order to 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 advance. But uh, certainly, the macro level is essential. I, I do agree with with Eric because as long as there are no clear directives, no clear policies, uh, it will be difficult for uh, the culture, the science culture, the cultural scientists to change, to change for instance, no, there are other things that, that need to change. But um, the, the institutional policies are, are essential. But I think Eric can make, perhaps it can give us a more concrete response. <laughs> I'm not sure about concrete, but I, I, I give the response. Um, so um, I think that all three levels are really important. So um, yeah, certainly at the macro level, that's where some you, some thinking is being done. Some consensus building is developing. That you know certainly journals are trying to to you know do things right and and um, and set set things, you know, sort of the fair principles, the care principles, 
to um, all the efforts that global institutions are undertaking. Those are really important. I think there's um those help guide many of the institutions that they sort of set in place some prioritization of other institutions. The institutions that I was talking about at the macro level were, you know, these academic institutions and the social impact institutions, the openness institutions. And the idea is that those are competing with each other. And without some sort of direction at the global level, you will not necessarily have the prominence of openness if that's what society would like that you won't have the prominence of openness that you would otherwise at the same time you know researchers are relatively rogue i mean they're they're doing things that 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 um they're responding to incentives in their own units and you know they're publishing in academic journals that uh, give them prominence and make sure that they can advance in their careers and we saw this in in covid where there was real tensions between scientists who did not want to share until things were peer-reviewed because of fear of saying of you know presenting something that would hurt people more than it would help people and then there were others who wanted to share so that there was greater engagement of a broader set of researchers uh, in an open process. And both are correct, right? Both are reasonable. Um, and so these individuals are, are prioritizing for, for different contexts and for different rationales. What I didn't talk about is the sort of the meso level. And, and when I heard um, Anne and Andrea talking, um, I thought about more of the meso level. And the meso level are this sort of, um, is, is not well developed. I mean, it's very, this meso level is a sort of network of meso level actors that are coordinating the rules coordinating the governance principles, coordinating, you know, um, the, the ways of doing things, the coordinating the inclusionary principles for knowledge. Um, and what happens in a global context is you have these sort of broad principles and then it's very difficult to connect to micro behavior. Um, universities have their own way you know different organizations have their own way um i think that uh, to um there needs to be greater and it wasn't in my presentation but greater emphasis on the meso level as a way uh in organizing the meso level it's not sufficient for example for the university of montpellier to be to be working on its own. It needs to be working connected uh, to universities in, in, uh, in Latin America and in Africa and in North America on, on coordinating what it means to have good governance for data and good governance for, for um, and, 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 and making sure that people, researchers, and um, contexts that have less access or less connected, um, have uh, uh, less uh, ability to participate, uh, that there are, there that these are not isolated, that they are actually actively in the middle connecting the sort of the broad policy things, which are really hard to understand at a micro level, um, for teams, for projects, for researchers. And I don't think that that meso level and the network uh, that connects the meso level actors um, is particularly well developed. Um, and so we, at a global level, we can sort of create these documents and at a micro level, we can fund projects, but in between, where are the consortia to sort of help govern um, and, and ensure sort of 
openness that that addresses all of the different logics. Thank you, Eric. You brought oh sorry, and then we would have an answer in a minute here. Please can you raise your hands? Go ahead, and yes, I... thank you. Yes, I, I couldn't get the, what you said, but yes, thank you. Thank you for giving a, a, again a, a chance to, to say something because precisely on this last issue that was mentioned by Eric, I think one good example of, of, of a serious effort to connect these various levels and bring this the, 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 uh, this uh, top level directives uh, down is uh, what UNESCO is doing uh, to uh, ensure that there is an implementation of the open science recommendation because uh, they have set up uh, work, these working groups and they, they are um, um, making a, a thorough study, a, a monitoring of what is happening in, in, in each and every country uh, what policies are being put in place and what uh, what's the status of the infrastructure in the various regions, etc. So, um, and, and still it is not ideal. Uh, particularly, I see still uh, a problem uh, in establishing the, the bridges with the, with the academic community that is somehow isolated and perhaps doesn't it very often doesn't want to even know about what open science is and uh, what's in in there for them. Uh, but uh, it, it is an, an effort that is uh, worth looking at. I, I invite you to look at the, at the UNESCO website uh, on what they're doing for the implementation. And also, um, somebody asked uh, about uh, DORA. I've put on the chat um and the links to to the dora which is a very important initiative um that started already long ago in in at the meeting the scientific meeting in san francisco um and another important document uh, just very recently issued is uh, this uh, reform of scientific publishing by international science council uh, I put also the link on on the chat. I think this shows that things are moving, and and at least at that level, the scientific community is already being brought on board. Let's say <laughs> gradually. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Very short remarks. Uh, thank you for. I fully really agree with uh, everything which has been said. Um, uh, just to say that uh, I'm just back from Paris and we have spent three days, three full days, with all representatives of uh, universities working uh, as a vice president or whatever uh, for open uh, open science. And we are very lucky in Europe and France, I think, that uh, Europe has a very strong regulation uh, on uh, open science. And as it comes from Europe, then we have to implement it uh in uh, in France and the ministry is working a lot with us as a network of uh, vice presidents and it's like you know uh by directional um discussions the ministry asking us to implement and us going back to the ministry oh this is difficult this is easy this we need your help in this and this and this and we we have this strong network and we discuss a lot with the other people so that's not easy, that's not done, but uh, yeah, just to say that networks and meso, <laughs> this, uh, this level counts a lot, and uh, that's, uh, yeah, I fully agree with, with you. So my comment was exactly the same. Social networks are very important, and the different, uh, how the different networks uh, uh, relate to each other, which are not just the difference, but focusing on what brings us uh, more or less together. Uh, from our side, all the work we do, we try to align it with, even though it's uh, bottom up, and we try to align it with the upper dimension language, and that go, you know. So there is a question of, uh, I mean, from, from, from experience and from the work we're doing, uh, we say the same thing with different words. <laughs> 
but we are discussing more about the terms that we use and, and, and the definition of these concepts rather than actually working towards different actions that could actually uh, help to to to, uh, to our objectives so here i kind of align this kind of vision of the smaller in which i differentiate the institution uh, from the organization bringing the institution as an agenda you know an agenda that uh, it is not supposed to be a uh, specific it's supposed to be large enough for people to work on kind of the same direction if we're asking that to the macro level, we're asking the wrong question, maybe because the macro level is not supposed to, uh, even though it's supposed, we will know it's not answering to the local questions. But if we bring things, the, the, the organization, uh, even from this institution, uh, at UNESCO, for example, the organization is the way in which teams are, are working towards that. And this is something that is a cultural thing uh, from the organizations, from the different people that work there. It's a linguistic also a thing how we communicate to each other. And indeed, the, it, it, I see a huge gap in the meso dimension, uh, which is yeah the intermediates with, among our different sectors and, 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 yeah, and views. So, yeah. Thank you. Do we have a question in the, in the audience, I believe? So we have some fellows from the Make It program. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for all presentations and for discussion and for the opportunity for discuss this subject really, really uh, important in, in our development in general. Um, I'm thinking in the we are talking about organizations and institutions, but I think we are talking about a particular kind of institution. Uh, very important in the production of knowledge and scientific companies. And what go, what kind of communication or commitment coming from companies in, in this context? Very important. Can I add on to that question? Oh, of course. Hi, my name is Yeet Ratman. I'm also a big in federal. Um, and then you maybe stole the, at least the first part of my question. So the, to add on to it, um, there used to be a lot of, or there still is a lot of conversation about governmental transparency mm -hmm. and the importance of transparency as a function of good governance. Um, so if we were to think about open science as part of good research or good academic practice, um, I, I'd like to just, you know, add add this component of can you help us think through both the corporation level and the 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 institutions um, uh, operating within uh, government as they um, as I think both sides end up blurring with the research world and, and having important um, uh, norm setting examples and. Uh, and important roles to play as we think about how knowledge is produced. Thank you. Who wants to answer to that? And then we have uh, uh, at least two, two questions on the, on the online audience, and then I see a couple of other questions in the room. But maybe you can start with this. Uh, to talk. I just want to check that Ana Maria and Eric are getting the sound well. It's okay. Are we hearing now? Yes, so so. Okay. You have an expert here. Okay. Um, thank you for the, uh, raising this question. I, I, I like it. Um, companies are sometimes I, I use them to, you know, to. Um, to tell uh, resources uh, around me, go, go and open uh, your science. Um, what a nice example when IBM acquired Red Hat, um, saying that, can you see, this is a very commercial company, IBM, and 
the, the one to Red Hat, which is open source and they still make money. So you will still make very good science and impactful science uh, if you open uh, previous data, whatever you, you do. So I think that companies are not that uh, you know far away from open science. Some of them are beyond us, uh, meaning regarding the university of Mumbai. Some of them are very close. And as we say in uh, in Europe and France, open science is all about open, as open as possible, as close as necessary. So we all know this. And um, regarding this, yeah, I, I, I must uh, mention that uh, this is uh, an important point. Regarding uh, governments, uh, when I said that Europe has a very strong regulation, in France we have this law uh, back to 2018, is it? Uh, law of the Republic of America, law, and uh, it's mandatory. It was the case before, but now it's more and more written. Uh, so we have this um, in mind for, for instance, uh, public uh, bodies, territorial bodies, the city of Montpellier, and so on. They are all more and more aware of this and we have uh when i said that i was in parliament with uh all the other vice presidents now every ministry in france has its own representatives for uh, let's say uh data governance and opening things and so on so and they all work together at this level so at every level we have this in, in france now uh, i i'm not saying everything is done i'm saying it's you know, um, something uh, we are aware of. Can, can I ask a question about uh, the third pillar that you mentioned in your talk? Uh, because so far, the question of open source software used in public administration, whether they are related to higher education uh, institutions or other kind of institution, is a big uh, um, challenge or because well, there are many uh, software that could be often, uh, depending on your discipline here, you may have used air environment or other kind of software, sorry. Mm -hmm. Or is it, uh, how can you promote uh, better practices in, in Montpellier? <laughs> this is a big, big point for me because um, the policy, um, in uh, universities is not uh, that easy to change. And maybe you can elaborate a little bit about this because um, we are trying to say that there's you know, no clash between uh, opening and having an impact. And in open source, because it's an old history, uh, uh, more than uh, on data and so on, that's that's real, but that's maybe the, the most difficult part. For some um, research fields, it's, it's so easy. Everybody will agree that we have to open uh, the sources, the software, and so on. So if you were speaking about R uh, in mathematics, in um, uh, physics, and so on, it's quite clear for colleagues to open uh, their softwares. If you go to, I don't know, to chemistry, for instance, ah. <laughs> it will not be as easy as it can be for, for the topic. So for me, it's like we have to, to have nice examples uh, and to uh, work at the measure level with uh, our institutions to promote this and to be fully aware of what is the law, what are the best practices, what do we want, and um, it's it's not that clear. So two days ago, it was released on this uh, report on uh, open source and open software in France, and uh, uh, even people very with very nice skills on this they were not aware uh, who was owning their software so that's not easy thank you
Before taking a uh, new question, we have two reactions, one from Eric, but before. Okay, so when working with companies, uh, it's a huge relationship of power. <laughs> so I would like to add to what you said, uh, what I'm not taking, what, where is my limit, and, and where I should say no, and have it kind of clear. Uh, and, and besides that, uh, yes, it, it depends on what you're offering, it depends on what they need. And yeah, it's a, it's a question, but that we're being very clear to myself and to ourselves, uh, the LPI, what we're not taking is, is very important just to keep in in our ethics and uh, in, in our own manifesto. And secondly, with the government, yeah, privacy is power. Unfortunately to that, apart from saying uh, like uh, joining a networks uh, of, of researchers or students, I take the, the bottom approach that is uh, going through education and, and teaching a privacy literacy, data literacy, media literacy uh, at different levels because that's the only way, unfortunately. But uh, yeah. Eric, can you hear us? Yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> so I um, I just wanted to comment on in the different sort of sectors and and good governance. Um, and the, and and you know I agree with a Anna Marie that universities aren't always very cooperative. Um, universities, uh, my university is talking about open science all the time, but, but uh, you know it's hard to find you know, consistency across the campus in open science at all. Um, in terms of sectors, you know, I don't really see that, you know, companies are terrible in many ways, but so are universities. Universities exploit people like crazy and collect all sorts of data. There's rules in place. But, and if you think about this in sort of, you know, in sort of a global sense, there's, um, some people who who can say no and some people who don't say no, some people who don't have the power or the backing <clears throat> support to say no. And I think that that at the meso level, this is where you put in place good governance, but it's not by just talking to other universities in the United States, in my case. It's by talking to and integrating, lots of different perspectives on what would be good governance of data and publication because not everybody wants to share their data um, native populations indigenous peoples do not necessarily want to share their data and um, and levels of transparency vary and um what is okay for data, data use under what conditions? Um, there's a lot of people who have been abused by in, in the data system. Uh, and I think um, good governance can start at the top, but, but ensuring that, for example, my university understands what good governance of data and publication and data use and sharing is in, Ghana or Benin or Brazil or Peru. I mean, I I don't think they ask those questions. And this is where the the met the meso level has to play a role. It has to sort of give representation across these different sectors and countries in ways that are actually actionable. And that means that people have to have the capacity to do that across the globe. And I don't think it's there yet. It's it's just not there yet. Um, so I would I would sort of say that on the company side, it's the meso level that provides localities and research to to sort of engage and respond to researcher demands for data in ways that are fair to whoever uh, is being engaged so i i think it's 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 a it's a complicated thing that and we talk about fragmentation and we talk about you know different sectors and you know pernicious behavior 
it is the meso level that can that can actually build some capacity there to be more um, thoughtful and inclusive about open open research. Thank you. We have a question from the others. Thank you for the to the presenters. I'm uh, Suleiman from uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, my question will be basically to Prof. Uh, Anna Maria. And uh, it's about uh, talking about the open science. Uh, we have there uh, a program called Inali, Inali program, which allowed the uh, academics to have wider access to, to publications. But uh, actually, it's not uh, enough. It's not enough because uh, the, the university, the academic, the, the research institution don't pay for open open access to, to journals. So we are mainly limited to, to go on uh, this platform in order to, to look for, for papers. And uh, it's not enough. I don't uh, I don't know whether in a, uh, UNESCO is, is part of uh, the, this initiative and uh, what UNESCO can do to power, allow us to have a wider access to, to the scientific publication. Thank, thank you. That's a thank you. question. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Well, this is a difficult question to answer because yes, there are conflicts of interest. And, and we are pushing, I particularly, um, and many others are pushing for true open access, both to authors and to readers, to publications. So, and uh, the fact is that the, the, the publishing industry um, is, is not um, open to changing its, um, its business model. Uh, it is a very um, uh, successful business model for them, and uh, th and this is a real a real conflict, and uh, it's difficult for UNESCO to do something because who is UNESCO? UNESCO are the member states, and uh, of course there is a set of values and principles that govern uh, everything in UNESCO. But when it comes to approving. Uh, a decision, the general conference will either vote in favor or does not vote in favor. And uh, not all member states um, are on the same line, let's say. Uh, of course, developing countries, we are the ones who have to pay double or triple, no? Because we, um, because of, the, of this business model. And it, it's it's very costly, very, very costly for, for the developing countries. But um, it's a struggle and we continue. And some of us, what are doing is pushing for open access as much as possible, uh, open access publications and uh, open access um, uh, repositories and uh, information systems that uh, provide free and open access for the journals like uh, the directory of open access journals like Latindex, my, my own system uh, that's working in, in all Iberian American countries. And uh, this is uh, at the meso level, but uh, um, uh, as, as long as uh, uh, the situation doesn't change at, at the other levels, uh, we will continue with this conflicting situation. And what I, I try to say, the message I tried to convey the, uh, at, uh, with, my, with my talk was uh, that if, if this, situation, this fragmented uh, situation, this context is uh, now um, inherited by the open science uh, system, uh, then it will simply uh, be extended and uh, it will be more difficult to find a solution that is equitable uh, and, and that provides access for all. And uh, when I say for all, I would like to to use this opportunity to to refer to something that uh, Andrea uh, had in her one of her slides because it was a very complicated slide with many circles and one of them uh, was the language and um, 
citizen science is certainly a very important component of, of the open science uh, ecosystem. But uh, what we have found in, in countries where uh, there are other uh, languages, uh, especially spoken by people who do not speak Spanish in Mexico, for instance, um, but they have an, another mo mother tongue, uh, is that um, before uh, thinking of citizen science, we have to establish um, some um, build some some bridges with those communities, those populations that use another different language, because uh, um, this those other languages doesn't even share the scientific concepts that we use normally. Uh, we take it for granted, but this is very far from from the reality. So the the language issue is is a big issue that has to be taken into account if we really want to be inclusive. In, uh, in this process of opening science. Thank you. Um, just to say, Mahama, we got your questions and we will address them uh, because they are very specific for Eric, Eric and Anne. So we will send you the answer about this repository. Um, well, time is always too short when the discussion is good. So we need to close. And I want to thank First, to every one of you for taking the time to be here with us today uh, for this discussion. I think uh, we are getting very important messages. The first one I think that there is engagement, but they see there are many, many things to do, and there is more dialogue to establish and more connectivity between the different levels, trying to integrate the efforts. Also, there is a prevalent problem of equity. There is uh, this utopia, this idea of open science that really are we reproducing the ancient system and we are bringing on this default to, to the new one. Uh, we penalize some regions more than others. Is open science, and I know the answer is not because the truth is inspiration from Anna Maria that been the initiative in the in the South American region. But there are other issues, maybe they are penalized by transitioning and migrating to a new system. This is an open question. Is the transition phase so expensive for some of the stakeholders that they won't be able to take the bus to this new system? So there are many open questions. So I think this has been a lie. We have not been conclusive. It's always the case for the next stuff. But I hope that everyone of you can take contact with each other and continue with this uh, dialogue and I see how so many possible interactions are fascinating how Eric and Maria kind of found a common to, uh, language there and I think we have many more conversations that will take place during the cocktail. So thank you again everyone and a big thanks to all our speakers. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. So everyone is invited to the cocktail that is waiting for the time. Oh, ça <laughs> 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 Sur, le, 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 sur la question de comment ça s'est dit, euh, s'il y avait des Ah, mais maintenant, les dataverse, les dataverse, il y a la sur chaque, chaque, chaque université a son propre. Euh, ouais. Ou même, euh, non, moi, le, oui, après, oui, si, chacun a son dataverse. Ouais. Avec, enfin, tu as le dataverse et tu as le. Dataverse, ouais. Et puis, il y a le. Le repository pour les, les publications pour qu'elles soient en accès libre. Enfin, on ne connaît yeah, pas so de. Ouais. Yes. 
Toi, tu fais ta thèse où, en fait Et c'est quoi, c'est thèse chiffre, du coup Est-ce que c'est une association Oui, c'est une association. Non, je ne l'ai pas. Je l'ai fait à l'Université de Paris. D'accord. Il y a une école de travail sur les frontières de l'interdisciplinarité. Du coup, c'est un doctorat school qui est au MPI. En fait, c'est une association, mais c'est une association qui a une structure, a, une, a un département à l'Université Paris-Cité. Ouais, elle est difficile à, à saisir, mais c'est ça qui est intéressant aussi. Exactement. Mais c'est ça ce qui nous donne la liberté. Oui, oui, oui. Mais du coup, le CRI, le, ouais, le CRI il était déjà avec ce statut-là. Exactement. D'accord. Oui, oui, oui. L'écrit avait commencé, bah, c'était plutôt du côté interne et biologique pour good. Et après, la, bah, parce que l'école doctorale, il est de la formation là-bas et il y a des laboratoires aussi. Ça fait partie de, de, la, de la faculté des sciences. D'accord. Il y a aussi une partie enfin, des labos de la faculté de, de, de psychologie. <rire> bah, C'est un peu intéressant et ça fait partie du PLS et PSL aussi ouais. avec euh, école normale supérieure euh... oui, ils ont trouvé ces trucs non mais enfin, c'est intéressant parce que c'est un peu un pied partout ouais. tu vois et ça reste avec l'association ça donne la liberté finalement qu'on a pour faire la recherche euh, sans passer par euh, la pesanteur des universités. Exactement. <rire> si on peut le dire comme ça. Comme ça. Oui. Et le... Très bien. On va tous se retrouver au cocktail. Ouais. Je ne sais pas si vous avez des personnes qui ont